And now we are going to introduce our first speaker. I am so excited. Um, we have such a wonderful keynote today. Today we have John Papa. Now, John worked for Disney for many years, contributed to many of the web apps and the experiences you've interacted with for Disney. I'm such a Disney fan myself, so I'm, I'm fangirling right now. He's here to tell us more about the journey from server to the Static Web. Welcome to Static Web Apps Conference, John Papa. How are you doing, John? Oh, you are muted. <laughs> Classic. This is like perfect, perfect start. We it's love this. the online web, right? We're all getting <laughs> used to it. How are you doing, Chloe? I'm doing good. You know, I, I watched some Loki last night. Speaking of Disney, um, I think I've become more of a Disney fan during the pandemic. Um, but John, I have, I have a Disney memory to share with you because you're talking today all about, you know, the, the the history of how we got here. And I think one of the first websites I ever visited um, was a 101 Dalmatians live action starring Glenn Close, Glenn Close uh, static web page about the movie. Um, any chance you worked on that? <laughs> Not specifically, no, but uh, there's there's probably a very good likelihood that some of the code that some of us touched, such as myself, is actually being used in some of those pages for the movies that are out there. Back in the days of AOL, I spent a majority of my time on Disney websites, so thank you for providing me with entertainment <laughs> as a youth. <laughs> AOL, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Got to get around those parental controls. Anyway, John, uh, I am so excited for this keynote. I will let you take it away because I know we have a lot to cover. But uh, if you have any Disney questions for John, put them in the chat. Y'all will cover them after. Take it away, John. Thank you, Chloe. And, and thank you, everybody, for coming here today online to join us for this live event. Uh, as Chloe said, uh, we're all very excited to share this with you. This is the culmination of a lot of people putting things together to really make a much more cohesive story for all of you. Uh, and today, this is about Azure Static Web Apps, but more importantly, it's about your impact on the modern web and the evolution of it. Because yes, people at Microsoft, such as myself and Chloe and others, have helped bring this to you, but really, this was all inspired by your feedback and all of the content that you've put out there and your experiences. So my name's John Papa. You can reach me here live or answer questions as we go through or you can find me on the web at Twitter at John underscore Papa. So what is today all about? Well, you're gonna hear about two hours of some really great content from some amazing speakers today, talking about APIs and CLIs and how we're deploying through DevOps to the web and some amazing stories about what you can build. And you're gonna hear about a lot of these different features. Here's just a couple of them. Azure Static Web Apps really combines all these things and more into one place. You get these integrated APIs, authentication, authorization, which is one of my favorite features because it's always a struggle for me to try to pull in security, make sure we've got SSL certificates in there and get our staging versions out and do this all at global scale. But it's important for us to just indulge a little bit about how we got here because it's really great that we can look at these moments in time like today when we're launching a brand new service. But how do we get to this point and what drove up to this is really driven by you. The web evolves because of all of that you put into this. Think about where we came from and your journeys may have started at different places. Some of us have been using the web since the web kind of cre got created, right? And then there's different features that have come out and others of us came in more recently and there's still folks who are yet to come into this industry. And all of us have had an impact by the choices that we've made. So what would have happened if the road was not taken? Let's take a look at back at some of the things, just a few that might jog your memory of where we've come from in the web. Some of you out there may have used things like Backbone or Modernizer. Or does anybody out there remember making HTTP requests with XML HTTP request? How about when Babel and TypeScript and CoffeeScript came out and introduced a new way to write JavaScript? What about the browser wars and the DOMs that were out there? And one of my favorites is, have you ever written an index HTML page and you had 100 script tags in a row where you, that's the way you actually deployed your application, pre-Webpack and Gulp and Grunt? All those things are part of the journey that got us to this point. And now we're using some amazing great tools like React and Angular and Vue and Svelte, uh, even new tools that came out last week like Quick. 
But let's not forget the server side story as well. ASP.NET has been a big piece of this along the way and tools like PHP. But I want to take you to a couple of moments in time that I think are really pivotal in how this got evolved. And let's start with where you were on your journey. So this is for all of us. You may have had experience a lot of those things I mentioned, like the cross-browser JavaScript days, when you had to write if-then statements, depending upon the browser you're using and the version of the browser inside of JavaScript, pre-web frameworks. And then some of us started with the jQuery era, where jQuery kind of solved part of those problems for us. We could write one set of code. And then we had some early web frameworks, things like Dojo and Backbone. Others of us are starting more recently where we got a lot of the build tools like NPM or Webpack or Vite or Snowpack, some of the new modern ones. And then of course, all the CI CD tools that we've been using for the last couple of years, that have really gotten amazing like Azure DevOps. And then the modern web frameworks that we use every day and let's not forget WebAssembly and Blazor. Likelihood is you're in one of these three categories of where you kind of jumped into the timeline of using your web journey. But there's also another group this is an important group. It's the people that are coming in today and in the future. Those developers are going to be inspiring what we do with those tools moving forward. So this story is for all of us to figure out how do we get here? Because really, this is one moment in time and one great product that we're looking at sharing with you all so make your lives easier. But it's just something that's gotten created because of you and the things you brought to the table. So let's look at three pivotal moments in the web. To me, jQuery was a game changer. When jQuery came out, it was effectively a solution to a big problem a lot of us had in the web. Everybody was trying to figure out how do we move more to the browser without having to write, if you're an IE5, do this. If you're an IE6, do that. If you're in um, Netscape, do this. If you're in Safari, do that. If you're in Chrome, a lot of conditional logic. It was really painful. And jQuery helped standardize writing code on the web in the browser. And then the DOMs got web standards. And then all those document object models became the same. And I remember the key moment when Microsoft announced years ago that ASP.NET's templates were now going to include jQuery out of the box, the most recent version of jQuery. And that was really a game changer because now we're talking about a very uh, stable, and widely used framework like ASP.NET introducing jQuery, a JavaScript library, which at the time, it was kind of crazy to think about all these different things we could do in the web. So this was a big change and it drew a lot of more people into using the browsers. And that was driven by people's desire to go to those browsers. Another thing that was really pivotal was when all the web frameworks started to get created and out of the guidance and patterns that people wanted. There were a lot of JavaScript frameworks and a lot of these libraries were out there. And it seemed like we were getting one every other week. And I think we did, to be honest. It was really getting kind of out of control. So what happened was people started asking, all of you, for guidance and patterns on web frameworks and how we should evolve these. And out of that, we got these different patterns we could use, like MVC and MVVM, and they got brought to the web itself into JavaScript. And out of this came the four most commonly used web frameworks that we use today, like Angular, React, Vue, and Svelte. And these things are constantly moving forward for us. So once we have these, now we can all agree, OK, we're going to pick one of our favorite web frameworks, and we'll drive the web forward with those. There was another pivotal moment in the web for me. And that was back in about 2015 when VS Code, or Visual Studio Code, was announced at the Build Conference, almost six years to last month. And why this was important was we had a lot of different tools that we could use to build on the web. I remember a moment when I was at Disney and we were being asked to standardize on the development editors for web development. Well, I went and did an inventory to find out well, what's everybody using. I came up with a list of 15 different editors and tools and IDEs that were being used. And it was very obvious right off the bat that there was no standard out there. There were tools like Vim and Sublime and Brackets and Atom and uh, IntelliJ and Visual Studio and so many different tools, Eclipse, uh, NetBeans, all these things were out there. And they were all valuable in different ways. And Visual Studio was a response, Visual Studio Code was a response to we needed something to be lightweight to fit in that timeline between super fast to edit files and also really rich IDE. 
And it fits somewhere in the middle to say, we need to have the power of the IDE, but the speed of those other tools. And today, um, VS Code is the most commonly, most popular used editor that's out there for the web. What this did is it helped us then drive the tooling into something like VS Code that helps us build these applications. Today, you can deploy an Azure Static Web App using a VS Code extension by clicking a button, which is just amazing. So these are three pivotal moments in time, but I want to talk a little bit more about why this happened. Because our story is a hero story, and the hero in this is you. You are the hero in this because you're driving all these needs. There's no magical force that's saying, okay, we need to move to this point in the next step of the evolution of the web. No, that magical force is you. It's all the stuff that you're building and the choices you're making. And companies like Microsoft and us are listening to those trying to help adapt and make your lives easier. So all of this happens, for example, in another pivotal process that happened uh, a couple of years ago. Today's modern web apps, the ones you use now, they all rely on a build process. And that build process is to help us get everything up into the browser. Gone are the days when we could just take a script and throw a script tag on the page or throw 100 script tags on an index HTML and let our app run. Now we need to make sure we're building things so they run in the browser and it's lightweight, we're not making a bunch of trips back and forth, and it's just super fast and easy. So we run npm run build. And we run npm run build in all these different web frameworks. What happens effectively is some compilation process works on a server and it outputs our HTML, our JavaScript, and our CSS. And those three things are the core of what the web uses. And that all goes up to the browser, along with other assets like images and fonts. So that will then light up our applications. And effectively, what we want is to take this build process and then the output of that goes in, up into the web and people can use it in their browsers. So then you can choose whether it's Angular, Svelte, React, View, whatever your framework happens to be, any of these, and they all run through these build processes and we get this output that we need. Okay, so you're making your choices for your tools. You have chosen that we want these build processes, but you also want to be able to just write code and get it up to the web. So let's take a step back here. What you do every day is build applications, maybe something like this application here in React. And let's think about what you do. You write code, you fill business needs, and then you try to publish to the web. So writing code is what you know if you're a developer and publishing out to the web is what your company wants you to get it done with. They want you to actually deploy and deliver. So what is stopping us from just taking the code you write here locally on our machines and then just pushing it up to the web? Well, let's think this through a little bit. You have your code, right? This is what you built and you probably keep it in some place like GitHub, your source control provider. That makes sense. And I think most of us these days are relatively comfortable with taking our code and putting it into source code, uh, source control somewhere. We can use tools like VS Code to push it up. So we push our code up to GitHub. That's great. And then we keep commits in there and we might have a br uh, branching strategy where we have our main branch that we want for our developments. And then we have some kind of staging branch and we kind of merge them in. So we have our own strategies for our integration of our code. And we'd like that to run continuously if we can with tests. Now we've got our CI and our CD. So we have continuous integration of our code, but we also want when we push our code for it to just light up on the web. So how does that code then get to a website? Do I need to get like an IIS server or Apache server or some Nginx? I mean, how do I host my code up on a website and get it to at global scale? And let's not forget about APIs. Most of our web apps need data. So are we going to create our own API server, maybe with like ASP.NET MVC or with Java uh, or hitting a third party website? And do we have multiple of these that are out there? Maybe we want to use serverless out there to use like Azure Functions to host them up. So we don't have to worry about the servers. Okay, now once we have a website, our React app here, and we also have our APIs, Azure Functions, we could run into a problem of cores. You know, those cross origin requests that we have. We're serving on two different servers, right? So how do you actually communicate between those two securely? That's where you have to make sure you've got like a reverse proxy. 
Uh, and up there, the reverse proxy has to route your request from your web app to your API. Okay, we have to set that up and our business also needs a custom domain. I said I worked for Disney before. You're not gonna see um, a Disney site up on some random URL, right? There's custom domains, whatever your company is, you've got your own custom domain. And SSL is super important. We want there to be security on our site and all the standards. So we have to get our SSL certificates. Authentication is really important because I'm breaking down that we need the websites to say, you are who you say you are. If you're gonna to go to a site like this shop at home example and react, I need to make sure that when Sally logs in or Chloe logs in, that I know it as indeed Chloe. So I need authentication. Well, I also need roles because maybe Chloe logs in or I log in or you log in and I know who you are, but now I need to know what can you do? So authentication and authorization for roles. And of course, global scale. Right now you're sitting somewhere at your house or your business or maybe outside enjoying the outdoors and where you are could be anywhere in this world. We wanna make sure that our application is deployed at scale at the closest point of presence to where you are using things like CDNs. And we want redundancy built in. Okay, so that's what you're doing today. You're building apps with code, but you need all of this to happen in one place. Now, how can you do that? Well, you easy, you just go to any major cloud provider and you use their CI CD, you kind of create some functions or some server side with APIs. Maybe you employ some kind of route, um, reverse proxy. You can pull in your own authentication providers if you want to. You can customize across multiple different services. And all of these are things that you can do in one place with multiple services, but you have to tie it all together. The key is though, and we heard the feedback and the industry has really changed on this. The pivotal moment we're in now is that nobody wanted to do these things and many, many others. Nobody wants to go out there. You didn't want to go out there and put 10, 20 things together. We wanted the services to do this for us. This is a common pattern. Think about when you drive a car or you ride a bicycle. If you had to go buy all the parts and then put it together yourself, that's not nearly as great of experience as I just wanted to ride the bike or drive the car. You want somebody else to put those together for you so we can use those vehicles. And that's really what Azure Static Web Apps is, is the vehicle to take all those pieces so you can not think about them and you can just think about, I want to write code and get us to this great place. So really, this just needed to be a lot easier and it needed to be a lot faster. So we took a lot of your feedback and we created to this point of what we could do with Azure Static Web Apps. So let's take a quick look at what you're gonna to see today in Azure Static Web Apps. This is where we are. As of the live launch, you can make your code changes and then you can choose, okay, do I wanna run through GitHub Actions to deploy my apps or do I wanna use Azure DevOps or maybe another source control continuous delivery mechanism? So we're gonna see how we can write our code, we can push it, and then after it's pushed, it could build automatically on a server. You don't have to worry about building it locally because now we've got a server that'll do that for you. And then the service will then deploy your static content. Static content just represents your HTML and your images, JavaScript, CSS. It's static because now it's built. Um, we push it up to the website at global scale. And then optionally, if you have APIs with your serverless functions, you can push those up to Azure Functions as well. And collectively, that is Azure Static Web Apps. All of this happens within, could be seconds or could be minutes, depending upon your build process. So I write code, I push, and it goes up and gets deployed to the cloud at scale. Now that's all on the cloud, but if you might be thinking what I was thinking when I got into this is great, so I can, write all this and make it work in the cloud. But if I've got serverless functions running the cloud and I've got all this other stuff uh, working with my application, how do I know that what's working in the cloud works locally? And how do I know what works locally works in the cloud? I want my development environment to work as closely as I can to what I have up in the cloud. And I bet you do too. We don't want any surprises. Again, when I worked at Disney and we had to put something out major. I didn't want to get a phone call at two in the morning because something I did didn't work in production, but it worked locally. Um, that doesn't really fly, right? So you want to make sure that what you have locally works up there. So it's all about confidence and trust. 
So one of the great feedbacks that we heard from you all was this, that you wanted it to work as closely to emulate local what's going to happen in the cloud. And out of that, you're going to hear a great story today from Wasim right after this keynote about the Static Web Apps CLI and how you can do the things that are in the cloud locally on your computer. You can emulate your authentication and your API requests. It can handle that reverse proxy for you to tie in your static web app with your functions. And you can run it all local so you can have that confidence in what you're doing locally is also going to work after you push to GitHub and it eventually ends up on Azure. So it's really great that we have this feedback mechanism to how to get there. And to this point, there's a lot of ways that we've heard this feedback. So these are some of the recent features that we listened to you on and you drove to be in the product. So for our launch, I've mentioned some of these like choosing your own web framework. You can choose the four I mentioned, or maybe you choose Next or Gatsby or Nuxt or Quick or 11T or many of these others that are out there. Maybe you're just using vanilla JavaScript and HTML. That works too. Or possibly you're using Blazor with ASP.NET and you're using WebAssembly. Those are features that are in there today. You drove them. We also heard that you want a first class support for something beyond just GitHub Actions. So now we've got support for pipelines like Azure DevOps as well and more coming. Your feedback also drove that not only did you want SSL certificates to be easy to use, but you also wanted them to be automatically deployed and then have Apex domains or root domains. So I could just say shopathome.com or .dev for my application. And then I just mentioned how we have now a CLI and a local emulator. This was in response to you all wanting to have to be able to run it locally and what's in the cloud in the same way. These are features you drove. And it's really important to understand that this journey isn't complete unless all of us are driving this together. My job at Microsoft is a developer advocate. And as a developer cloud advocate, what I do is I listen to you and bring feedback into the product teams and then back out from the product teams to you. It's that mechanism that I really enjoy because I get to hear your stories and your experiences. And we get to take your feedback and really work with all the teams to figure out what's the right thing to do to keep the web moving forward. And that's the best part of this job is I get to work with you all on really fulfilling your dreams and what you want to come out with this. So the feedback doesn't stop here. This is a great day because there's an opportunity for you to engage with the people who created great websites in the community, people who've created Azure Static Web Apps and different features, and also with each other. This is the next step of one of those pivotal moments in the web's journey. And the feedback will continue. And now we invite you to join us here to ask questions and then also to continue that story by adding your issues and concerns and questions up at our GitHub, uh, GitHub website, where we can consolidate all that information and continue to listen to your feedback. So thank you all for coming here. And Chloe, I turn it back to you. It was, I was just feeling so nostalgic for some of these older technologies that you mentioned, John. Um, and I couldn't agree more. I was uh, recently teaching some new students programming who are completely new to software engineering and explaining this whole concept of not having to reinvent the wheel and using other pieces of technology to not having to start from scratch, I think was a huge mind-blowing lesson for them. They thought they'd have to build everything by hand, reinvent the wheel. Um, what are some of your favorite, well, first I'll ask, do you have any like missed or, you know, you kind of have a nostalgia for technologies that aren't with us anymore? Do you miss any? I, I know recently Flash was taken away and I remember Flash was a huge part of the internet uh, when I was watching a lot of online animation. Any ones that you're, that you're missing these days? <laughs> I wouldn't say I'm missing a lot of them, but I definitely have memories of, of several. Uh, I think a lot of what we've done has moved forward. Uh, in some ways, the one thing I miss a little bit is there are times that I feel like, you know, it was, you always, the grass is always greener. It was nice when I could just create a script tag and throw my code in it and just go. But it wasn't realistic either to build a full-fledged application in a script block in the middle of an HTML page either. So. <laughs> But, you know, grass is more greener, but you know what? I'll, I'll look back fondly on that. Right. And I think, you know, we really take for granted now how many tools we have available to us. Like, we truly have a lot of things. We stand on the shoulders of giants, truly, and that we have all of these pieces that can help us 
put together a, a web, either a static website or a huge, huge application um, very quickly. What are some of your favorite uh, new ones out there? Oh, one of my favorite new tools is the way that uh, Vite is working with the ecosystem. So we can run what's locally on the web. So we have a dev server and we can also get that instant uh, HMR basically. I never remember the exact acronym. I'll be honest here. Hot module reloading, hot module replacement. Effectively, what it means is you type code and it's instantly changed inside your browser. And we've had evolutions to that, but I feel like Vite is just the next level to get us there. And one of the other things I really love is uh, I'm really loving using Svelte out there. I love all the modern frameworks, but I just, maybe it's because it's newer, a um, couple of years old versus some of the others, but I really enjoy the simplicity of using it. We have a great question here, which uh, it, it's, I'm sure people are, are thinking this as we're talking about static web apps today. Is static web apps the ideal choice for a personal blog? Oh, that's a really good, good question. So if you're gonna create your personal blog, I guess the first question is, are you gonna create your own or are you gonna go use a service? Which is, I think is everybody should start there. And I've done both um, and there's pros and cons to each. But if you're gonna create your own, I think it's a great choice for running your own personal blog because effectively you're gonna be creating content. Maybe let's just say you use Gatsby, uh, maybe Eleventy, and you're creating your own content and then it ends up being just static files. So your output of those, you could host them up on a CDN and you want them to be super fast and global scale. Uh, seems like a great choice to me. Yeah. And I guess it really depends on, uh, you know, how you're going to be using it. But I think I, when I think of static web pages, I'm thinking blogs, I'm thinking personal brand websites. There's so many different uses. What are your favorite uh, kind of use cases for static web apps that you've seen out there in the wild? So I kind of lean in the other direction because again, my, we lean towards our biases. And my experience has been building uh, things like we talked about at Disney, large websites that millions of people use. And I can think now and back, if I had these tools 10 years ago, <laughs> when I was doing some of those things, I wouldn't have had to deploy VMs and servers everywhere to do what right? I did. I, I, my favorite thing is when you go to a website and you see it's running uh, on a CDN like this, and really the only thing that is leaving the server are the HTTP requests that are being made to these APIs on these backend systems. And to me, that's, that's really the core of Azure Static Web Apps, what it serves. We've truly come so far from the days of GeoCities, Angel Fire. I remember spending many time on my my O Town fan page, <laughs> GeoCities. But it's great because I feel like this makes it so much more accessible to folks and you can just get up and running so quickly, which is, I yes. mean, I mean, tell me, John, back in the day, was there, other than the GeoCities and Angel Fires of, of the world, of course, how easy was it to just spin up something like this, like in your time at Disney or before that? Well, before that, before we go in the Wayback Machine, a lot of it was just FTPing to a server. I was yeah. talking with uh, Craig Shoemaker, one of our doc documentation writers who does a lot of the work on static web apps this morning. And he was having memories of taking his own websites for his company, zipping them up and FTPing them up to a website on a server, you know, 15, 20 years ago. And we can still do that. But back when we had more, um, let's go back maybe five, 10 years, a lot of our process was create our own build steps using tools like Grunt and Gulp to take the files. And we used new words that were, they sounded fancy, like mangling and minifying and putting bundles together. Um, and that's really what it was. The problem was there were so many different players involved that you had to learn a wide plethora of things to get it done. Webpack kind of solved that. And that's kind of where Azure Static Web Apps came in, right? Uh, now to deploy to the web, when somebody says deploy, they expect all those things I mentioned to be there. And Azure Static Web Apps is just like, press a button, you're done. It's magic. Truly, I remember, speaking of nostalgic uh, early internet, um, I remember being obsessed with Smarter Child. It was like one of the first chatbots that you could talk to on AOL mm -hmm. Instant Messenger. If you told me now that I could like whip up a uh, chatbot in like, you know, 10 minutes with tools like Logic Apps, I'd tell you, no way, that's not... I can't build anything like that. So it's so cool we have these just kind of almost puzzle pieces that we can put together to assemble these huge, huge projects that we put on or just a static web app. So, oh my gosh, I'm I'm so, so excited for all of the other uh, talks that we're gonna have today. But John, any, any final words before we hand off from the keynote to our other talks here today? 
really just more about uh, the feedback and you all out there. Just we're listening. And it's not just us. The whole industry is listening to the things you're doing. I think about, again, the road not taken. When you're driving down a path and working on your development story and your business solutions, think about the choices you're making and share them with us. Share them with the world. Get on social media. Get on GitHub issues. Talk to us. Come to Learn TV. Really engage with us because together we can build so much more moving forward. And I don't think this is the end. This is a launch day, but this is really just the next step on the evolution of where we're all going to be in you know, next year and five years down the road. I can't wait for next year's Static Web Apps Conf. Thank you so much, John, for that amazing keynote this morning, for kicking things off. Um, and I can't wait to, uh, I'm going to look up some of those older web technologies. I, <laughs> some vintage ones on there that I have not touched. I'm very curious about. But um, I'm going to be also hitting you up with some Disney questions later. we got to talk about the new Loki. <laughs> Anytime. Come visit. Thank All you. right. Thank you, John.